give you a little bit of a brief time, and we'll start our second talk around mortgage and screen. And that, and then talk to me also about now, and give you your time, and we'll just give you a little bit there, and we'll be back. So let me just give you a little bit of um, our first speaker we have to do the long obvious times and I'll set up uh, counterfeit Catholicism. Last page of the application misunderstanding that she is totally correct. And then to the round of Prayer is Father Mark Stephan. He's a family friend. He was a doctor in theology, a very good Franciscan, traditional Catholic priest. And then the bottom picture, um, last year, less than 50 feet from where I'm standing, a burning Sicilian soy for Christians, being anxious. They came to the conference, and then he got sick shortly afterwards, and both died. So, you please turn them to the mercy of two. Turn them to, to God in the prayers. And I'll finally burn with all the pictures I made here. But she's a Christian in Portland, the Queen of Angels for many years. She died here in Spokane recently. The name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. By the end of the Christ, the power of Newsweek, September 18th, 2015. This issue is quite interesting because with the darkened picture of Francis, he posed the question, is the Pope Catholic? The query was prompted because even they realized that Francis' actions, teachings, texts, and words contradict the teaching of the 260 legitimate true popes and 20 general councils of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church effectively safeguards, explains, and defends the cause of faith without error until the end of time because she is infallible. She's a trustworthy teacher of divine revelation, the Christian way of life. Father Van Orn said the privilege of infallibility is not merely actual absence of error, but the impossibility of error. The dogma of papal infallibility means the Holy Ghost guides and preserves the Catholic Church through the success of succession of legitimate popes who have ruled the Church through the centuries. Confusion of Catholics caused by Vatican II is based primarily on the fact that many people know that the teachings of Vatican II are heretical, that the new Mass is invalid. Many of the faithful know the Council formed a new church that is not the Catholic church religion established by Jesus Christ and perpetuated by the apostles and their successors. Yet they also know the Pope is infallible and that obedience to him is part and parcel of being a Catholic. They're faced with a seemingly serious dilemma. My dear beloved in Christ, there's a mountain of evidence to prove that the conciliar Pope's including the current occupant of the Vatican, have persistently and publicly professed heresy by word and deed. Beginning with the apostasy of John XXIII, they worked tirelessly to destroy the church from within through numerous radical teachings, drastic changes to the liturgy, false ecumenism, interreligious dialogue, and promotion and defense of the disastrous Vatican II revolution. But the Pope did not be a heretic. Have the gates of hell prevail. Since our Lord is faithful and will fulfill his promises, the church is indefatigable and will endure to the end of time. We must ask ourselves, what then is the logical explanation for the current situation in the church? It's a fact that a pope cannot be a public or manifest heretic. He cannot officially teach doctrines or a person who practices. Someone who's not a Catholic cannot be the head of the Catholic Church. According to St. Robert Allen, St. Athanasius, St. Augustine, St. Antoninus, St. Cyprian, St. Jerome, 
A manifest heretic cannot be true. Could it in any way be false? An evident contradiction follows. For then God himself would be the author of error. In its dogmatic constitution of the Church, the Council of Vatican I of 1870 taught the first condition of salvation is to keep the norm of the true faith. For it's impossible that the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, should not be verified. And their truth has been verified during the course of history. For the apostolic see the Catholic religion has always been kept unsolved and its teachings kept holy. The Sea of St. Peter is always remains unsolved, and its teachings are holy according to the divine promise of our Lord and Savior. Now this charism of truth and never and faith was conferred upon St. Peter and his successors in this chair, in order that they might perform the supreme office for the salvation of all, that by them the whole flock might be kept away from the poison of the air and be nourished by the food of heavenly doctrine. The whole church, preserved as one and secure in its foundation, stands firm against the gates of hell. Our Lord told the apostles, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. He who hears you, hears me. For Christ expressed promise is evident that the attribute of infallibility was given to the Pope and the Church so that they can carry out their mission to teach the eternal truths and to lead souls to salvation. The Pope's function is to hand down the deposit of faith unchanged. There's sufficient evidence to prove that before their election, John Paul VI, John Paul I, John Paul II, Benedict XVI and Francis I were moderns and had departed from the Catholic faith. Several were Masons and Communists. Since they publicly professed anti Catholic modernist doctrines, they proved themselves to be heretics, which automatically nullified their elections. By divine law, they were ineligible to be elected because a modernist pope is no pope. Father Marcus Stephanie said, if it's true as some theologians recently be maintained, that a true Pope, one validly elected, cannot become a heretic because of a special divine protection, cannot, for that reason, fall from the papacy, then the only logical conclusion to draw is that a heretic occupying the chair of Peter was a heretic already before being elected, and could therefore not have been a legitimate candidate for election to the papacy to begin with. In 1559, shortly after Luther's revolution, Pope Paul IV feared that a Protestant might be elected to the papacy. Therefore, he decreed that if a heretic were elected, such a promotion was null. The same would apply to a modernist heretic who was elected and appeared to have acceded to the papacy. Would not be the Pope. If ever it should appear that the Roman Pontiff, whether prior to his promotion to Cardinal or prior to his election as Roman Pontiff, has beforehand deviated from the Catholic faith or fallen to any heresy, we enact a decree to proclaim, determine, and define such promotion or election in and of itself, even with the agreement, the unanimous consent of all the Cardinals shall be null legally invalid void. It shall not be possible for such a promotion or election to be deemed valid or to be valid, neither to reception of office, consecration, subsequent administration, or possession, not even through the putative, in other words, the supposed but illegitimate enthronement of the Roman Pontiff himself, together with the veneration and obedience accorded him by all. Such promotion or election shall not through any lapse of time in the foregoing situation be considered even partially legitimate in any way. Each and all their words, acts, laws, appointments of those so promoted or elected, and indeed, whatever flows from them, shall be lacking in force 
and shall bear no stability and legal power to anyone whatsoever. Those so promoted or elected by the very fact without need to make any further declaration shall be deprived of any dignity, position, or title, authority, or office, and power. The elections teach that heretics are excluded from the papacy. Appointment to the office of the primacy. What is required by divine law for this appointment? Also required for validity is that the one elected be a member of the church. Hence, heretics and apostates, at least public ones, are excluded. Heretics and schismatics are barred from the supreme pontificate by the divine law itself. It must certainly be regarded as excluded from occupying the throne of the apostolic see, which is the infallible teacher of truth, the truth of the faith, and the center of the ecclesiastical union. The law now enforced the election of Roman Pontifex is reduced to these points. Barred is incapable of being validly elected to the following. Women, children who have not reached the age of reason, those suffering from habitual insanity, heretics, and systematics. By doing the other Christ of Pope, were it effect from the Catholic faith, he would immediately lose his office. This is confirmed by canon law. There are certain causes which test and resonate with an office which is accepted in advance by the operation of the law and has without any declaration. These causes are number four if he's publicly fallen away from the Catholic faith. For example, Martin Luther separated himself from the Catholic Church in 1517. Three years later, he was excommunicated by Pope Leo X. The Luther had already been deposed by God for his public heresy. St. Robert Bellman clearly states that Pope was a manifest heretic by that fact, per se, ceased to be Pope and head of the church. Just as by that fact, he ceases to be a Christian and a member of the body of the church. This is the judgment of all the early fathers who teach that manifest heretics immediately lose all jurisdiction. St. Antoninus said, in the case in which the Pope would become a heretic, he would find himself by that very fact alone and without any sentence separated from the church. A head separated from a body cannot, as long as it remains so, public heresy would cease ipso facto to be a member of the church. Therefore, we cease to be head of the church. My new beloved Christ, the true Pope cannot promulgate heretical teachings or issue decrees opposed to faith and morals in his ordinary and solemn teaching authority, ex cathedra, because he's protected by accountability. Ecclesiastical laws promoted, promulgated for the universal church, for the direction of Christian worship and Christian living, are also protected by infallibility. Monsignor Bannon has written, the Catholic Church can never sanction a universal law which should be at odds with faith and morality, or would by its very nature be conducive to the injury of souls. It would be impossible for a true pope to approve the new mass, a spiritual poison that's sacrilegious, promotes false doctrine, and certainly constitutes a danger to one's faith. A pope cannot approve a law, Canon 844, the 1983 Code of Canon Law, to re, to, that allows non-Catholics to receive the sacraments without enduring their error and professing the Catholic faith. My dear beloved Christ, Jesus Christ is and always has been the divine but invisible head of the Catholic Church. Our Lord has willed that his vicar, the Pope, should represent him as a visible head of his church on earth. This means that it is impossible for the church ever to become headless, either when a pope dies or resigns, or when a public heretic is elected, because Christ still reigns as your head. The word said of Pontus is composed of two Latin words, which together literally mean the chair, means chair of St. Peter being vacant. Sedative consciousness 
is an undeniable fact. Because when a pope dies, resigns, or falls into heresy, the chair of St. Peter is vacant. Said of the conscience of that is a small theological position of those traditional Catholics who believe in the papacy, papal infallibility, the primacy of the Roman pontiff, and yet do not accept the concealment of the Pope because they have defected from the Catholic faith. The Church teaches that a heretic automatically loses his office without need of any sentence or declaration. If anyone agrees that the changes are evil, then the Catholic Church, by our Lord's promise, cannot give the evil and error but still insists that the Vatican II popes are valid popes, possessing papal authority from Jesus Christ, he maintains that the Catholic Church is defective, that our Lord's promises are null and void. Whatever his reasons, they are illogical, and he is an error. Leaders, the leaders of the conciliar church, John XXIII, through Francis, have set up what is in reality a new church, it's outside the Catholic Church founded by our Lord. They have publicly professed heresy and repeatedly done things that have been condemned by the Church as heretical. To mention, men cannot put an end to the perpetual succession of popes, no matter how long the public heretics may occupy St. Peter's chair. The Catholic papacy comes from the line of God, not from man. The theologian Father George has written, the church is a society that is essentially monarchical. But this does not prevent the church for a short time after the death of the Pope, or even for many years, from remaining deprived of her visible head. Since our Lord did not determine just how long an interval of interruption was about to last until the election of the next Pope, a long interregnum does not mean the end of the perpetual succession of posts. Although generally it was of short duration, there have been times when the interruption lasted considerably longer, including a vacancy of three years and seven months in the fourth century, and two vacancies lasting over two years in the 13th century. The church has never determined how long a vacancy in the Holy See may exist. Whether there is a true Pope, an anti-Pope, or no Pope, the teachings of the Catholic Church remain the same. Even when the chair of St. Peter is vacant, the papacy still exists. Jesus Christ is the head of the Catholic Church, and the Pope is his neighbor on earth. The relentless attacks against the Catholic Church by communists, ecumenists, Freemasons, and largists have been carefully planned, calculated, and skillfully organized. They knew that if you strike the shepherd, the sheep will be scattered. Since the Catholic Church is a hierarchical structure, their primary target was the papacy. This has been foretold in the Bible. Sacred Scripture states, an Antichrist will appear before the end of the world. The way must be paved first. The false popes have paved the way for Antichrist by tearing the church apart one brick at a time. It's likely that Antichrist will not rule the world while a true pope is reigning. It's obvious that a legitimate true pope would do everything possible to dissuade hundreds of millions of Catholics from following Antichrist. St. Paul says in his second epistle to the Thessalonians that there's an obstacle restraining Antichrist from making his public appearance. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work, provided only that he is, is at present restraining it, does so restrain until he's gotten out of the way. And then the wicked one will be revealed. When this restraint is removed, Antichrist will make his public appearance. Some scripture scholars and theologians believe that this restraint is a papacy. It's some powerful force embodied in a person who was already present at the composition of the epistle. According to Father Barry, the papacy seems to be the logical impediment to the appearance of Antichrist. It's a matter of history that the most disastrous periods for the church 
were times when the papal throne was vacant, when antipopes contended with the legitimate head of the church. When writing the secret of law selected to be given to no one but Pope Pius IX, one of the two missionaries, Maximin, asked how the word pontiff was spelled. It said that Melanie betrayed great emotion while she wrote her letter, but was in no way embarrassed and wrote rapidly. She suddenly stopped, masculinated the word infallibly. She asked the spelling and meaning of the word antichrist. Our Lady of Austin let sad glance towards Rome before returning to heaven, provided us with much to ponder. St. Eustace's angelic intellect devised a plan to destroy the Catholic Church from within. What better person to use than a false pope in order to deceive and mislead Catholics? The false popes formed a new church that is not Christ's church, but a clever counterfeit brought about by a nearly complete apostasy of the hierarchy. According to Satan's plan, Catholics would follow the counterfeit church's false doctrines without question through false obedience. Experts in deceit, the promulgators of attitude banked on Catholic's obedience to the church, especially to the Pope. The fourth commandment obliges us to obey the legitimate orders of our lawful superiors. And we know we must obey the true Holy Father, but no allegiance is due to heretics. Still, various individuals, individual Catholics were proposed a response with which they feel comfortable. Some individuals have a false allegiance to the Pope. They simply refuse to even consider the possibility that he could be a false Pope. They have a closed mind in the subject, ignoring the fact that closing their eyes to the errors of the heretical modernist Popes. Some individuals feel safer if the chair of St. Peter is occupied by a heretic rather than letting it stand vacant. Some people say the Pope doesn't know what he's doing. He's in good faith, ignorant of the teachings of the Church. In its section on offenses and penalties, Church law declares that when the law is violated, for example, the radical teachings, the intention is presumed. Therefore, it's presumed that he acts consciously and willingly. Canon 2200 states, when an external violation of the law occurs in external form, the existence of malice is presumed until the contrary is proved, because in the ordinary case, man acts knowingly and When confronted with the current situation in the Vatican, some persons say, don't judge. God permits us to judge the actions of others if it's not rash and hypocritical, but just and charitable. God gave us the ability to discern what's in accord with the Catholic faith and what's contrary to it just as he gave us the ability to form judgments about sin and virtue, right and wrong, evil, true and false. The words, the first C, nobody speaking about the Pope, is judged by no one from Canon 1556. The 1917 Code of Canon Law refers to true popes, not modern heretics. According to Father Martin Stephanie, with knowledge and understanding of the true faith, we not only can recognize and judge from Pope is straight and choice from the true faith, but we have the obligation to do so, as well as say so, even publicly. Others will contend that Catholics have been taught that they must obey the Pope. Yes, we must obey the true Pope, Christ infallible vicar. The Catholic cannot disregard his ordinary and universal teaching authority. Once again, though, there remains the fact of heresy and illegitimacy. Because they have been told, said of Pontus, are schismatic. Schism is rejection of the authority of the legitimacy of the Christ. You're not obliged to obey a modernist heretic who calls himself Pope. Said of Pontus, are not schismatics. There is no true Pope to obey, as we've already pointed out. St. Paul has written, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel to you other 
and that which we have preached to you, let it be enough that the popes consistently defended the deposit of faith and trusted their care by Christ. Never had a single pope, even among those who called, caused scandal by their conduct or had weaknesses, never had one erred in his specific function as pope in his teaching as universal pastor. Never had one pope contradicted another in matters of faith and morals. On the other hand, John XXIII and his successors introduced the changes of Vatican II, invalidated the Mass and many sacraments, promoted modernism, ecumenism, and other heresies. Catholics had to choose one or the other. My dear stated, let no one deceive you in any way, for the day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy come first. Why does God allow such deception and error? He permits the current situation in the church, nor that we may turn to him in prayer so we can find and follow the truth. This powerful deception, the universal apostasy, brings about the purification and perfection of the faithful. By persevering in the true Catholic faith, we prove our love and fidelity to God. Anyone who has the Catholic faith deeply rooted in his mind and heart, even if he's highly educated, on seeing the anti-Catholic teachings and actions of Francis will spontaneously say, how can such a person be a true Catholic Pope? How can he be a Catholic? Father Martin Stepnick has stated, you need not possess any juridical or hierarchical power or authority to make a declaration regarding Francis. All you need is to let your Catholic faith speak up. Nor do you need to send some kind of ecclesiastical SWAT team to Rome to remove Francis from the chair of Peter, for he has ready to post himself in the chair of Peter, and God will do the rest in his chosen time. God gave you the gift of the true faith plus the understanding that goes with it. Use it. My dearly beloved in Christ, Funkins. Today it's attacked by so-called traditionalists who severely limit its scope to very rare occasions, perhaps once or twice a century. Even during the Vatican Council of 1869 to 1870, Several bishops objected to papal infallibility by alluding to the cases of Pope Liberius, Pope, Pope Honorius I, and John XXII. These cases were hotly debated, but all objections were successfully refuted. One group accused Pope Liberius of heresy because when tortured, he supposedly signed an ambiguous document that could have been interpreted as promoting Arian belief. Under thorough investigation, the council exonerated him. In the case of Pope Honorius I, it was shown that he was guilty of failing to condemn the Monothelite heresy, but he never defined any new doctrine whatsoever and actually forbid the making of any definition. His fault, his failure, his fault was the failure to use his apostolic authority to combat the heresy. The third council of Constantinople under Pope Leo II condemned the Nestorius not for heresy but for grave omission. The case of Pope John XXII in the 14th century was also refuted because his was a fault of conversation, not of preaching. Thus the senseless contentions against papal infallibility were silenced. The Council Fathers of Vatican I proved beyond all doubt that not a single pope had ever erred when acting in the office of shepherd and teacher of all Christians, defining by virtue of his supreme apostolic authority a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the universal church. Vatican I formally declared papal infallibility a dogma of faith on July 18, 1870. What about the bad popes who cause scandal by their evil and immoral conduct, such as John 
twelfth, Benedict the ninth, Urban the sixth, Innocent the eighth, Alexander the sixth, Leo the tenth, and others. John Farrow has written the only un only happy fact to emerge from the dreadful reign of John the twelfth, and it is remarkable, is among the numerous villainies perpetrated by the consecrated miscreant, there was never any pronouncement against any of the dogmas or moral teachings of the church. Alexander the Sixth, who lived during the Renaissance, is considered by many to be the worst of the popes. Even though he was, he never attempted to challenge or change the doctrines of the church he headed. My dearly beloved in Christ, some people attack papal infallibility by citing St. Paul's rebuke to St. Peter. St. Peter scandalized the Gentile converts because of his adherence to the ritual prescriptions of the Mosaic law. And his conduct was imprudent, but according to the unanimous teaching of the ancient fathers and doctors of the church, his management in this matter was the fault of conversation, not of preaching or doctrine. Infallibility has nothing to do with the personal conduct of the Pope, nor does it mean that he cannot sin. It has to do with his office as defender of the deposit of faith, in spite of the fact that several Popes caused scandal by their immoral lives, and others were weak and ineffective leaders. Nevertheless, God preserved each Pope from teaching doctrinal errors, thereby safeguarding the truths of the faith for nearly 2,000 years. From the time of the apostles up to the death of Pope Pius XII, not a single pope had ever taught heresy or erred when teaching the universal church in matters of faith and morals. Every pope from St. Peter to Pope Pius XII consistently taught the same doctrines because they were protected by papal infallibility. If one pope could come along and teach one thing and the next pope teach exactly the opposite, than the papacy is a farce. In 1870, Vatican I declared papal infallibility to be a dogma of faith and defined its five characteristics. We, with the approval of the Sacred Council, teach and define that it's a divinely revealed dogma. That the Roman pontiff, when he speaks ex cathedra, that is, one, when acting in the office of shepherd and teacher of all Christians, Two, he defines. Three, by virtue of his supreme apostolic authority. Four, a doctrine concerning faith or morals. Five, to be held by the universal church. Possessed through the divine assistance promised to him in the person of St. Peter, the infallibility which, with which the divine redeemer willed his church to be endowed in defining doctrines concerning faith or morals. Although infallibility has its limits, the only requirements are the five characteristics just mentioned. Many people have a misunderstanding of the term ex cathedra and limit the Pope's infallibility to only his solemn declaration, used on very rare occasions, such as when a Pope in an extraordinary manner defines the dogma of the faith. According to this erroneous belief, it would be that outside of those rare occasions, we could believe whatever we wished. They are totally ignoring the Pope's infallibility in his ordinary day-to-day -day teachings. The Pope is infallible so that he cannot teach error to the universal church, he can faithfully pass down Christ's teaching in their fullness until the end of time. If I follow the teachings of the true Catholic Church, I can be absolutely certain that I will not be led into error by accepting them. Sadly, modernists, even so-called traditional Catholics, choose to limit papal infallibility to very narrow parameters. This is erroneous. Bishop Sheehan, M. Sheehan clearly explains the scope of the Church's infallibility. The Church may convey her infallible teaching to us either in her solemn or her ordinary authority. With solemn authority, she commands us to believe all doctrines contained in the four creeds or expressed in the definition of the popes or the general councils. With her ordinary authority, she commands us to believe the doctrine which the pope and the bishops throughout the world in the everyday exercise of their pastoral office 
unanimously teach as revealed truth. The church is infallible in her ordinary teaching as she is in her solemn teaching. In its dogmatic constitution concerning the Catholic faith, Vatican I refers to the church's ordinary infallible teaching authority. Moreover, by divine and Catholic faith, everything must be believed that's contained in the written word of God or in tradition that's proposed by the church as a divinely revealed object of faith, either in a solemn decree or in her ordinary universal teaching. Now Pope Pius XII reaffirmed this when he wrote, nor must it be thought that what is expounded in encyclical letters, an ordinary method of papal teaching, does not of itself demand consent, since in writing such letters, the Pope does not exercise the supreme power of their teaching authority. For these matters are taught with the ordinary teaching authority, which is true to say, he who hears you hears me. And generally what is expounded and inculcated in encyclical letters already, for other reasons, appertains to Catholic doctrine. But if the Supreme Pontiffs and their official documents purposely pass judgment on a matter up to that time under dispute, it's obvious that the matter, according to the mind and will of the same Pontiffs, cannot be any longer considered a question open to discussion among theologians. My daily beloved in Christ, once it's understood that the chair of St. Peter is vacant because we have no Pope, the question arises is how would it ever be possible to elect a valid Pope in these evil times? We don't have to worry about who's going to elect the next true Pope because God will take care of it in his own time, doing it in his own way. From the time of Adam and Eve to the Incarnation, the world was without a Redeemer. God delayed the coming of Christ our Redeemer for thousands of years. The crisis of a world without a Redeemer is much more serious than a world without a Pope. Due to God's infinite wisdom and power, he undoubtedly has a plan for the salvation of souls, drawing good from evil. In the meantime, our Lord remains and will always be head of the Catholic Church. With God, all things are possible. In his own timing, God can provide a Pope. A truly Catholic man professes a true faith in its entirety, unchanged. When and how God will accomplish this is a mystery, but not an impossibility. Since the decree of Pope Alexander III in 1179, cardinals have been papal electors. However, prior to 1179, popes were elected by various means. In the present crisis, God can restore to the chair of St. Peter, the successor of his, tro of his choice, with or without cardinals. Another question is brought up by some concerning the canon of the Mass, where the Masali Romanum contains the words, Unum cum famulo tuo Papa Nostro meaning together with thy servant, our Pope. According to the rubrics of Selwyn, inserts the name without the number of the reigning Pope and bows his head slightly toward the missile while pronouncing the name. If the Holy See be vacant, he omits the words, etc. A final point is brought up by those people who refuse to follow traditional Catholicism because they say, how can so many people be wrong? How can so many good and intelligent people be deceived? Mark Twain said, it's easier to deceive than to convince someone he has been deceived. Right is still right if only a minority is right, and wrong is still wrong even if the majority is wrong. 